Our second speaker this morning is Professor Celia Dean Drummond. Dr. Dean Drummond graduated with an MA in Natural Sciences from Cambridge University and then studied for a doctorate in plant physiology in Oxford. She's currently on the faculty, oh, and then she went on, by the way, not being satisfied with one doctorate to get another one, earning a doctorate in theology from Manchester University. She is currently on the faculty of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of Chester. Um, a daunting scholar, she has written a whole series of articles in both science and theology. I'm just going to mention a few of her most recent book-length works in theology, and that would include Christ and Evolution uh, in 2008, Creation Through Wisdom, Theology and the New Biology, Genetics and Christian Ethics, and Wonder and Wisdom, con Conversations on Science, Theology, and Spirituality. Her talk is entitled, Beyond Separation or Synthesis, Christ and Evolution as Theodrama. Please join me in welcoming Professor Celia Dean Drummond. <laughs> Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. Is, uh, oh yes, hang on, just make sure the microphone works. Um, and thank you, it's a great honor to be with you this morning. It's a great honor to come here to the John Riney Center and I want to thank those who invited me to this this morning. Um, and uh, it's, it's a privilege to be among those scholars of both uh, theology and also those who are natural scientists. I hope to convince you in this lecture that we can go beyond a simple choice between either friendship between science and religion or hostility between them or even separation of science and theology or synthesis. I think many of the debates that we have in the theology and the natural sciences miss out what I would see as the core tenant of the Christian faith and that is um, the place and significance of Jesus Christ. Christology, on the other hand, as is done in the theology and religious studies departments, uh, misses out summarily considerations of science. So we have a gap then that I believe needs to, to be filled. On the one hand, the choices of those faced with the gap sometimes go down what I would call the synthetic path. Um, and that, again, uh, leads to various grand narratives that I think we need to resist. I hope to show in this lecture that instead of such grand narratives, we need an alternative, and that alternative is one of theodrama. And I will explain what I mean by all these terms as we, uh, as we go through this morning. So in outline, then, I'll briefly introduce the way I'm going today. And then I will talk about um, Christology and evolution as the basis of what I'm going to be speaking on, um, looking bri very briefly at the classical debates, and then the, the liberal reactions to those classical debates, and then finally um, an alternative through uh, an understanding of, of theodrama. So first of all then, the historical conflict between evolution and Christianity is something that we've heard about already in this, in this conference. And very often it's represented in this way, but historians who seek to dig deeper, like John Hedley Brooke, for example, will say that much of this history is read as conflict in a way that's unnecessary. In other words, um, it's not as conflictual as it might appear if, once we go down into the deeper realms of, of historical understanding. At the same time, um, Arthur Peacock, who was a, a scientist and also turned uh, theologian, presses much more firmly for a belief in evolution as representative of friendship, drawing on the work of Aubrey Moore, who, um, again, talked about Darwin as a disguised friend of faith. We might want to um, ask why he went down that route, 
He believed that he, he was a disguised friend of faith because it forces the believer to reconsider um, God in a way that perhaps, um, that in perhaps is, is not so po possible to, to do if we don't have Darwin there. In other words, Darwin asks us to think about issues about creation, about God, about who we are in relation to that creation in a way that's easy to push to the background if we don't have the challenge of, of Darwinism. Some of you might think, well, what kind of friend can Darwin really be to religious faith with people like Richard Dawkins around, representing, I would say, en enmity rather than faith? Of course, Richard Dawkins makes a number of fundamental mistakes, not least seeing God as one cause amongst other causes, which you've already had completely demolished by William Carroll earlier, uh, just before I spoke. The, the paradox, of course, of this is that some theologians will also say that Dawkins is actually a friend because now we can, um, now we can tell people what God is really like. Um, namely, we can go back maybe to either the classics or some other way of representing the relationship between God and creation. I believe, though, that there are alternative ways forward to this stark choice between enmity or, or friendship. And that's what I hope to unravel this morning. Christology in the, in the classical accounts, and again I'll run through this very briefly, um, those of you who are not theologians may not be a, a, quite so familiar with some of this. Um, in the classical accounts, uh, Christ was considered both human and divine, and the preservation of the human and divine nature of, of Christ uh, came through the Chalcedon definition in 451. On the one hand, there was the Alexandrian tendency, which stressed the divinity of Christ, with a focus on the word made flesh. Um, and uh, on the other hand, there was the Anti Antiochian definition, with the emphasis on Christ's humanity. If the Alexandrians tended to emphasize the divinity of Christ to the, uh, and the humanity of, of Christ was less left to the background, on the other hand, the, um, the Antiochians, with the emphasis on humanity, something of the, the divinity of Christ uh, was sometimes, um, sometimes lost in that process, with the emphasis on the human soul of Jesus, for example. And it led to a position where there ended up being two persons somehow, in both the divine and the human person in the person of Jesus. So there were a number of confusions that arose as a result of these debates. And it led to a, a theoretical discussion of the difference between anhypostia which is human nature in the universal sense, and en hypostia, which is the human nature of Jesus in the particular sense. Another uh, discussion um, was about perichoresis, that is about the dynamics of the interrelationship between all three persons of the Trinity. Now, if you're a scientist on the in the audience, I suspect that um, at this point you will have either fallen asleep or switched off because all these debates are closed and they are internal to theological accounts. They don't take us um, in any way towards uh, an evolutionary understanding. They don't seem to connect with science at all. They are, if you like, internal theological debates. So at this level, you might understand with someone like Arthur Peacock, who's had a history of being a biologist and a scientist, um, uh, to come, who comes to these classical traditions, he is understandably going to react um, and, and it's one reason why I would say that some of the dominant models in science and religion have been uh, liberal reactions to these tendencies. Arthur Peacock then presents Christ as an archetype or moral exemplar. And he draws here um, on the, uh, Jeffrey Lamp, who's a theologian uh, who's written about uh, Christ uh, in this way. He also speak, speaks of uh, Christ as showing God's character as love being displayed in the person of Christ. Christ appears as humanity made perfect, and Christ is emergent divine reality. We've heard about emergence yesterday, but now Christ is portrayed as the emergent divine one, as it were. Christ's divinity relates to his perfect obedience. So all these things are, if you like, understandable if you're a scientist. That is, it doesn't necessarily challenge our um, uh, scientific understanding if we, if, we, if we weaken the sense of the divinity of Christ and allow us to think of his, his divinity as a kind of emergent divinity 
um, operating through perfect obedience. And so I would say that he ends up with a, a naturalistic Christ. This isn't the word he uses, and, um, and uh, um, unfortunately, um, although this, the book that I've written, in, which relates to this area, is dedicated to Arthur Peacock, but it's dedicated to his memory because he died a few years ago, and unfortunately he's not here to argue back. But anyway... Um, I'm sure that uh, he was always one who was happy to have a good conversation. So I think that, that he would be happy for me to portray him in this way. But, but um, if anyone wants to reply on his behalf, then um, I will take the questions afterwards. But this is what he says. This is my interpretation of what he says. Jesus is, quote, the manifestation of what, or rather of the one who is already in the world, though not recognized or known. Jesus then has an emergent transcendence. We recognize Christ through what I will call a bottom-up Christology. That is, Christ emerges from, uh, from the ground up. And this is in contrast to his top-down approach to the relationship between God and the world, where God works, if you like, through top-down relationships. And some of those, that understanding of top-down relationship came up in the discussion yesterday. I would say that it would be very hard for him to come up with an understanding of Christ as somehow uh, um, uh, working through a top-down approach on his humanity. So therefore, he has to have a bottom-up Christology in order to uh, compensate for this um, inadequacy. Another author who's written, um, uh, if you like, in opposition to these two, the, the two natures Christology, the classical tradition, is Arthur Ian Barber. Um, and he says um, similar things to Arthur Peacock, but he says this, um, what was unique about Christ, in other words, was his relationship to God, not his metaphysical substance. Even though he had two wills, he was also able to exercise human freedom and personal responsibility. So in other words, what he's doing here is he's claiming that there's nothing particularly special about Christ, but he was able to exercise responsibility in a particular way. And he, like uh, Arthur Peacock, interestingly, draws on Geoffrey Lamp, so they're both using the same author to develop um, a, a spirit, what I call a spirit Christology, rather than a naturalistic Christ. So Bar Barber understands Christ as spirit-filled, a pattern of union between God as spirit and the spirit of humanity. Christ is also the model Adam, a new stage in the evolutionary process. Now, at this point, we might ask ourselves, well, what happens to redemption? What is the basis on which we can speak of humanity as somehow conformed to Christ if, God, if Christ is just understood as a stage in evolution? How can we understand our own humanity as somehow being redeemed by this Christ as, a, as, a, as this in newly emergent stage? The newness of Christ in terms of is, is just confined in, in Barber's thought to personal relationships, ideas, and also the response of the community. So the difference between Christ and other humans are one of degree rather than anything more substantial. But would I really be inclined to worship Jesus as Lord if this is the only difference between Christ and other human beings? I might be just as inclined to, to worship a politician on that basis rather than Christ. So in other words, I, I, I believe that this kind of approach to Christology is inadequate. And just to reinforce that, um, he says this, that Christ is the distinctive but not exclusive revelation of the power of God. And he goes on and says that Christ is God's supreme act. And Christ's uniqueness is the content of God's aims for him and is in his actualization of those aims. Now, one of uh, Barber's concerns is to, is to not offend other religious traditions. And, if you, and what's interesting in the way he's presented this Christology is it forms a very, very small section of his book on religion and science. So it's, it's only covered in a couple of pages. So you've got virtually all he says about his Christology. That's the extent to which he weakens his, the Christological basis of his work. But he's, he's doing that for a reason. He doesn't want to upset those of other religious traditions, it seems. And so, therefore, he wants to tone down the Christological understanding in a, in a way that maybe is understandable from those of other religious beliefs. 
behind and lurking, in, as it were, is a, a rumor in the background for both um, Ian Barber and Arthur Peacock is another figure, the figure of Pierre Ch uh, Théard de Chardin, the um, paleontologist and Jesuit priest, who um, was a pioneer, I would say, in looking at the relationship between science and religion. But um, there are problems with his view in that I believe that he situates his evolutionary view according to a, a progressive model rather of Herbert Spencer rather than um, a model um, that's more authentically connected with Charles Darwin. His metaphysics, then, is less Darwinian than you might think and more aligned to Spencer. He also has a very lineated, linear model of, of, uh, of evolution with uh, Christ portrayed uh, um, as, in some places as emancipated from time and space um, and more than simply emergent from evolution. So he doesn't commit the same mistakes as, as, uh, as Barber and, and uh, Arthur Peacock. He was writing prior to them. So they've stripped away his, his metaphysics in, in, in their interpretation of Teilhard de Chardin. But at the same time, there is a, as it, there's a linear um, approach to evolution. Uh, and I would say that it, that kind of linear sort of anthropocentrism is the kind of myth that um, Simon Conway Morris was speaking about yesterday. So he, he sort of adopts one of these myths. And it's not just about the branches in the tree. It's a, it's a version of the tree that is, it has a very solid trunk. And we don't need to, if you like, divert from one side to the other um, in, in looking at that. And, and it's pointing always towards humanity. So in, in, uh, in Teilhard, we find this, that Christ is at the crossroads where everything can be seen, can be felt, can be controlled, can be vitalized, can be in, in touch with everything else. Is that or not an admirable place in which to position or rather recognize Christ? Well, yes, at one level, but no on the other. And it, it seems to have separated um, Christ from, uh, fr fr from who we are. It's kind of put him in, in an ether in a way that's um, maybe not all that helpful. His view of the incarnation, then, is understood in an, in a, in an evolutionary perspective, but at the same time, his, the, his understanding of the cross is, a, is one in which relates to the cosmic perspective. So he puts Christ's work on the cross. It's certainly in there, but it's now translated into a cosmic formula. And then Christ, as, as, um, as I mentioned before, is emancipated from time and space in this particular version. And he says this, in one of its aspects, different from that in which we are witnessing its formation, it has always been emerging. This is, here he's talking about Christ, so Christ, the, the idea of Christ as Omega, above a world from which, seen from another angle, it is at the same time in the process of emergence. So he has an emerging world and, uh, and, a, and a kind of emerging Christ, but Christ is sort of somehow there from the beginning as well. So it's a number of different... Um, of the ideas coming together. For him, the future always impinges on the present. This is what renders the movement not only irreversible, but irresistible. So it's, it's inevitable. It's an inevitable process. It's a linear process. It's one that, that we cannot go back on. It's one that's, if you like, always drawing on um, Christ as the example. Here, God is the, also understood as the prime psychic mover in the divine, divine milieu. We have this understanding of God's presence. Of course, the Teilhard de Chardin is a complex author and a number of other aspects I could go into, but I'm really just using him as a background to what I want to say next. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm just going to raise one or two problems when, in the thought of Teilhard before moving on to my own particular um, uh, arguing for a different kind of perspective. First of all, his evolution is understood as progressive, and I don't think that's the correct way of, of seeing evolution, not, certainly not in the way that Teilhard seems to interpret it. He also um, stresses um, anthropocentrism in the evolutionary process in a way that's in inaccurate. It would be more accurate to say that it's linking up with cosmology on views of... Uh, of um, uh, the anthropic principle, or something like that, rather than evolutionary biology. There's a tight association of Christ and evolution, so Christ seems to be tied into the evolutionary process, 
although ironically he's also understood as a somehow in another metaphysical space. His understanding is fully focused on Christ and it, and it becomes remote from the historical Jesus. In theological terms, we call this Christomonism. His understanding of evil is also neutralized or naturalized, if you will. Um, and while he did uh, talk about evil, it's, it's inappropriate to say he didn't discuss it at all. It's not something which he, he dealt with in any, uh, in any real kind of way. It became part of the process then of evolution, to think of evil was there, as sort of wrapped into this process. And so it led to a very great optimism about science and human progress. And so those who draw on Teilhard de Chardin have to bear in mind that he thought that Hiroshima was maybe a, um, a one human was a, also a human achievement in some respects. So in other words, he didn't seem to be able to distinguish um, different elements in science and be critical of them. He was highly optimistic about science and, uh, and human progress. And I would say that this was related to his, to his particular interpretation of who Christ was in relation to um, the natural world. We come to a, um, an alternative view. Um, I think that, uh, with due respect for the paper we just heard, that um, we do need to take account of history. If we're going to think about the particularity of Christ, of who Christ is, we cannot consider Christ apart from that historical reference. But the history of nature has very often been portrayed as a grand narrative or a story. And if we're going to be truer to theology, especially truer to an understanding of the New Testament, I think we need to get back to particularity again. Cosmological accounts then encourage a grand narratives to develop, and this is particularly true in authors like Thomas Berry and others, which are very popular, especially amongst eco-theologians and others who are looking maybe for an alternative way of thinking about the relationship between um, God, evolution, and the natural world. But there are others as well um, who, uh, who, who speak in what I would call grand narrative terms. Theodrama, then, is an alternative reading of, of history from a theological perspective, and I hope to show you how this alternative reading works. So that's not the only thing I'm going to say about theodrama. Theodrama weaves together history and future hope, so it's concerned with God's purposes, um, and therefore it's concerned about our future as well as the future of, of, the, of the earth in which we're placed. Theodrama is normally understood, though, has been confined to human history rather than evolutionary history. And I, here I draw on Ben Quash's work, who's written a, a book called Theology and the Drama of History that was published a few years ago with Cambridge University Press. And I, um, I, I'm quoting him because he was one of the people who inspired me to think about this more clearly. He says this, theologians are prepared to see, in, th in, uh, uh, in dramatic terms that is, to see the dense historical world as having an origin and an end in the cre creative purposing of God, a God who can relate personally to his creatures. People ready to acknowledge the idea that there can be a revelation, a provenient ground for our knowledge and perception that is not the product of our knowledge and perception, which is neither accidental nor impersonal, impersonal, which freely and even lovingly communicates itself. So here we arrive then at, the, at, at attention, the tendency for theologians to adopt um, standard, what I call standard historical methods. Um, and, uh, but this is maybe an alternative reading of, of history, one which, if you like, situates ourselves within a, a, a position of, of revelation, as well as um, simply treating history as a, as a kind of, uh, as, as another science. So here we're, we're prepared then in theodrama to consider history and eschatology together. And drama um, is about particular human actions in particular contexts. That's theodrama as, as understood through Quash. Theodrama, are, those actions are actions in relation to God's purposes. So the stress then is on human agency, the context of the actions, and also the plot 
Here we find subjects, uh, a stage uh, on which we're acting, and also um, a particular emphasis on action and, and human freedom. So it resists, then, making either subjects or structures the key to an interpretation of history. And what Quash argues um, is that historians have tended to either focus in on subjects, particular key subjects in the history of the world, or particular structures as a way of understanding it, whereas um, a, a dramatic approach tries to stress the encounter between God and God's creatures, and also in this way, creaturely freedom is preserved. So we're not thinking, it's not the kind of inevitable um, event uh, sort of somehow um, uh, brought about through the action of God in history. The creaturely freedom is genuinely preserved in this approach. If we want to expand this and start to include evolution in the theodramatics, then evolved creatures become more than just a stage on which human activity is played out. Nature then becomes historical, and this is, I would say, the gift of evolutionary science, that we're no longer thinking about nature just as something out there, but nature is something which has its own history. It's something that we can connect to in historical terms, even though, of course, that history reaches out way beyond that of human history. The common reading of history as genealogy or dynamics of historical change, then, is, is, uh, is challenged according to this um, way of doing things. And, uh, and the uh, alternative also applies to both human and evolutionary grand narratives. If we include non-human um, in the theodrama, then we try to avoid what Quash has called synchronic readings. That is, synchronic readings are readings of history which seem to have one inevitable outcome. Instead of that, we fail to give, this synchronic reading fails to give due attention to particulars, to the individuals, to the exceptions to the rules, to the resistances to explanation, and the densities of meaning that ask for recognition in a good description of historical reality. So there are problems with this syn um, synchronic approach. If we imagine evolution, then, more as dramatics, we consider the details, the details of what goes on at any given scene. It encourages a close examination of certain creatures and certain scenes. And we've had witnessing, witnesses, as it were, representing such scenes in some of the discussions we've had of primates and hominids for example, or maybe some of the discussion on ones which I like, which I can't go into um, now, which is on canids, that is, um, how um, animals behave and so on, animal behavior. If we widen the drama then, um, we also find that uh, drama takes account of the tragic. It takes account of the particular suffering of particular creatures in a way that synchronic narratives and synchronic readings do not. It also takes due account of contingency. So it resists generalized accounts of evil, and it resists um, generalized accounts um, which miss out the, the element of, of, the, of the tragic. There are, um, I would say, tendencies for epic readings, not just in the amongst theologians, but also amongst evolutionary psychologists and some evolutionary biologists. And it's particularly pronounced in evolutionary psychology, where a story is told, as it were, that seems to have an inevitable outcome. And it presumes that we can be outside as some sort of observer to these events. Instead, um, if we look at... Um, so, of course, uh, evolutionary psychology isn't the, only, um, isn't the only area which makes this mistake. Many theologians will make these mistakes as well, and... Hans Urs von Balthasar, in his, his, um, his book on, uh, it, well, he has a, a, a trilogy, but the second volume of the trilogy of the Theodrama, he says this, um, that epic readings smooth out the folds and say that Jesus' suffering is past history. We can only speak of his continued suffering in an indirect sense, insofar as those who believe in him are referred to metaphorically as his members. <coughs> 
what he's saying um, in, in that is that we're somehow missing out the complexity by focusing in on this epic reading, this grand narrative. At its worst, epic readings amount to the genre of false objectification. It substitutes, then, a monologue for the dialogue that should be possible. It substitutes, it, if you like, smooths out what we're saying and, and, uh, and tends towards determinism. And we've heard a lot about the determinism that's latent in the evolutionary narrative of Charles Darwin and how that has all sorts of negative implications in Nazism and so on. And I would say that that tendency towards syn synchronic readings in Darwin's theory of evolution needs to be strongly resisted for ethical reasons as well as for theological and scientific reasons. Reactions to epic um, theology might be lyric, that is, individualist interpretations of spirituality that just focus in on the mystic and on the um, uh, mystical interpretations. And uh, von Balthasar resists this as well. He says that the whole substance of an action is transposed into a highly volatile, highly individual, immediate and emotionally colored mode of response and expression. And it's interesting that Balthasar rem uh, reminisces us on some of the experiences he has of, of being in contact with the councils, the, the councils of the church, where he says that um, prayer is said before the meetings, that is a lyric, uh, lyric uh, approach, but this covers the kind of epic mode of delivery that very often happens in the, in the meetings themselves. But it's not just confined to the Catholic church. Those who are more in the evangelical traditions can sometimes read scripture in this way as well. Um, they can read scripture in a way that's epic. And so the alternative, which is this lyric reading, is not necessarily um, very helpful either. So um, other possible reactions to epic are what he calls theopraxy. And what he has in mind here are the liberation theologians who've rejected forms of epic theology. Um, he presses for the view that they are very often one-sided. Um, and at the same, But at the same time, I think that you can understand why they exist. Now, I'm not going to go into the uh, discussion that he has on liberation theology at this moment because it's not relevant. Um, but I'm, I'm just saying that there are other reactions to epic theology. But the alternative that he proposes is theodrama, that is the action of God in history. We have anticipation then in theodrama in a way that doesn't lead to the kind of resignation that you get if you go for an epic account. This theodramatic approach then frees up pe people and I would say other creatures to be themselves in a way that doesn't uh, give the impression that they're part of a process that they cannot avoid. And here we must note the influence of Ignatius of Loyola in, in Balthasar's work, who allowed a positive attitude to the natural world of God found in all things, and allowed a combination of, of lyric elements. So theodrama situates, as it were, at the boundary of the lyric and the narrative. So the, there are narrative elements in it. There is a kind of narrative because there's a plot, but at the same time it's not the same as narrative. It has a different texture to narrative because it includes the lyric as well. So it opens the way for inclusion of creation in the theodrama, although this isn't something that Hansel von Balthasar developed very much. Uh, but I would say that there are, there's a latency in his work that allows you to, to do this. And when, when Balthasar talks about theodrama, he says the following, that it so overarches everything from beginning to end that there is no standpoint from which we could observe and portray events as if we were uninvolved narrators of an epic. By wanting to find such an external standpoint, allegedly because it will enable us to evaluate the events objectively, we put ourselves outside the drama, which has already drawn all truth and objectivity into itself. In this play, all the spectators must eventually become fellow actors whether they wish to or not. So he's saying we need to see ourselves as participants in the drama, not as somehow pretending to be somehow outside that, uh, the dramatic domain in which we, we are. And this connects, I would say, to a kenotic Christology. Kenotic Christology, again, we need to distinguish that from the kind of um, kenotic understanding of the act of creation that William 
Bill Carroll uh, mentioned in the previous um, lecture. This is a different kind of uh, approach to Christology that is also, um, I would say, connects with the classical traditions as well. So it's not about the giving up of attributes. It's not about a focus on the essences of God that then have to be lost in some way. But it's, um, it is about a filial response uniting hum the human Jesus and the divine Son in a Trinitarian way. So it's atonement understood in, the term, in terms of the primacy of the canonic love of the Trinity. So we have, if you like, a Trinitarian understanding of who Christ is. It's a dramatic act amongst all the other uh, uh, acts in, in relation to, to God and the natural, and natural world. So it's inclusive, again, of, of, the, of the sin of creaturely being. So that is not avoided by this approach. So is um, such an approach um, that I'm arguing for, an approach to Christology and evolution as dramatics, meaningful for evolutionary biologists? Well, I hope some of you who, who are here who are evolutionary biologists will ask some questions. But I'm, I, 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 don't, I can't interrupt my lecture now and have a dialogue, which I could do, but I'm not going to do that. But I am going to draw on someone who is an evolutionary biologist called Jeffrey Schloss, and he says this. Um, now, he takes the idea from Evelyn Hutchinson. He doesn't develop it, but the fact that he allowed himself to say this at all, I think, is interesting. He says that the lines, the players, and even the plot may change over evolutionary time, though they are ever constrained by the props and settings and choreographic syntax of the ecological moment. I'd want to go further than this and, want, and not put ecology or the... Um, uh, ecological moment as somehow uh, just a stage in the way he seems to imply here. But um, if we look at the evolutionary perspectives, then the dramatic includes indeterminacy. In other words, indeterminacy is preserved in a way that I think is helpful from a biological point of view. Performance allows the inclusion of other creatures in that performance. So... Um, it, evolution, when we speak of evolution, it's more than just a speech about truth claims or about a rational system, which is the way evolution is sometimes talked about. Now we're just in there, as it were, in the texture of the dynamic movement. We are, if you like, somehow identifying with those creatures and are able to understand where they are in the scheme of things. The ideal and the actualized niches in the evolutionary history is something that Jeffrey Schloss has talked about in other words, there's a dis disjunction between these um, in the course of history. At the same time, the ideal is interpreted for him as the optimal. In other words, we never get to the ideal niche, but what we do find is optimal positions, a kind of improvisation of what is there um, and, and made use of in the course of the evolutionary accounts. He rejects, then, any sort of developed teleology partly because there are a number of myths that Simon Conway Morris has very helpfully talked about already, um, myths such as an inevitable increase in complexity over time. And other myths exist, such as the myth that parasites have, must have become mutualistic in the course of evolutionary history. Well, Schloss says that that's not actually the case. But, I do park, uh, but he also talks about Dawkins' extended phenotype as being helpful here in a way which I would disagree with. He gives an analogy between the resurrection and Dawkins' extended phenotype. I don't think that this is very helpful. I think that Christ risen as a superorganism isn't going to work in this context. And apart from um, anything else, I do, though, agree though it's lost that the trends in evolution so very variable processes. So our future hope shouldn't be tied into particular processes, and our future understanding needs to include the diversity of processes that we find in the evolutionary account. So if we tie our theology too closely into these processes, we'll find that, uh, that, that, that they, they soon fall flat, as it were. And this is where I'm nearly finished now. Uh, this is where um, Schloss says that a critique of eschatologies based on evolutionary aesthetics is that we have fashioned God after our own fallen image, at precisely the cultural moment when theology needs to recall us in eschatological hope 
to the renewal of his moral image within us. So what he's saying here is that um, authors such as, uh, such as Jack Hort and others who've talked about evolutionary aesthetics as the moment through which we need to, to perceive our interaction with evolution are actually mistaken because they, they fail to challenge us. They fail to challenge us, as it were, to, be, uh, to consider ourselves as, as, as having responsibility in this overall dynamic movement of, of change. So I'm now just going to come up with a number of, of conclusions, and again, I've nearly finished. First of all, I think theodrama avoids problems of the simple endorsement of evolution that we get in, in some contexts of the, of the uh, account between evolution and, and, and theology. It also gives due weight to Christ's significance without weakening the role of evolution. It provides a metaphor of how to think through Christology and evolution. Again, we mustn't see this as a kind of literalistic account. It's a metaphorical way of rethinking in a way which I think is, is helpful. It challenges both theology and evolutionary theory. Um, it challenges it to, to be more itself, as it were. So there is a metaphysics there. And, and, and in a way, um, Bill Carroll's uh, c conclusions about God being the ground of being and so on could still be compatible with this, um, with this understanding, but, but it also um, acts as a challenge to move on beyond that and engage in, in some more detailed dialogue as well. And then finally, um, I'm just uh, going to show you the, the outline of my book, simply because um, I want to show you how it could go on further than this, in that the, the drama of, of incarnation which I've, I've started talking about today is just the first part of what you can say in theodramatic terms. You, all, you can also say um, uh, that theology needs to engage with evolutionary psychology. You can talk about Christ as incarnate wisdom, for example. When you also talk about deep incarnation, Christ the form of beauty. And in the drama of hope, we, re, we can revisit the doctrine of atonement and so on. Um, now I, I don't want to dwell on that, but what I'm saying is that this is, if you like, the, the, the very first part of the, the first chapter. There's so much more that could be said, but I hope what I've said at least gives you an idea of maybe why a theodramatic approach may be helpful in thinking about the relationship or thinking through the relationship um, between, um, between Christ and evolution. So thank you very much. Okay, as before, we'll have, um, I'd like to have just five, six minutes of quick questions of information and clarification, and then I'm going to ask both speakers to sit up at the uh, table here, and we can have a discussion with both of them. Does theodrama avoid the linear movement that you criticized, that you criticized Thierry de Chardin for? Okay, um, that's a, I think that's a useful question. Theodramatics, as I understand it, is not like a, um, the script isn't sort of written in in a way that's, an in, uh, that's fixed, if you like. There's an improvisation that goes on. In the, in the theodramatic process. There's also a focus in on, on human agency. So there's a, there's a sense of, of uh, not trying to stand outside the process. And what I was criticizing in, term, in some of the, the, what I call the linear approaches, is that there's a, there's a focus in on, on a kind of detachment. Um, and it's as if there's only one path, the path into, in, through to humanity. That was what I was criticizing, and that sort of linear mo movement to to humanity. If you widen out the theodrama so, so that it's inclusive of other creatures as well as humanity, you avoid some of those tendencies towards what I would call um, a, a, a highly developed anthropocentrism. Of course, human beings are important, and I wouldn't want to weaken the place of human beings, but human beings are part of the theodramatics. 
Um, and the Christ is, is seen in that way as, as someone we can connect with in his own life, passion and death in a way that you don't get if you see it, as, uh, if you see it in, a, in a linear kind of model where, where Christ just becomes a, um, detached from the processes of evolution in Teilhard de Chardin or weakened to such an extent that he just becomes part of the evolutionary process. It is a very different way of thinking. Of course, there's some, there's some linearity there, but it's not a, it's not a univocal linearity. There is a, there's the opportunity for, dis, for um, development unfolding and so on. Uh, and so, therefore, it's consistent with um, what I would call e evolutionary biologist stress on contingency. Um, so that's what I wanted to stress. So there's a contingency embedded within it in a way that, that you don't get with other forms of, of grand narrative. Would it be consistent with Colossians, the hymn of Colossians? With? The hymn of Colossians? Yeah, well, if you look at the, the hymn of Colossians is, if you like, a, um, if, imagine you're talking about the wisdom, the, the, the wisdom hymn of Christ. That, that hymn of Colossians is about a cosmic Christology. Um, that hymn of Colossians, I would say, is entirely compatible with this approach because it's about looking at the the wider, um, the, 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 the wider engagement of Christ in all things. And in the chapter that I've, I've written in there on deep incarnation, I develop some of, the, some of that uh, thought more fully, but it's a diff slightly, it has a slightly different flavor to it than maybe the kind of um, interpretation of Colossians, let's say in Teilhard de Chardin or some other authors, that saw Christ as somehow separated from the natural world. So it's not... It's not denying the, the relevance of a, of a cosmic understanding of Christ, but it's trying to stress the uh, grounded nature of our relationship with Christ, that we mustn't kind of split off um, Christ from the, from the evolutionary process. Um, it's also, I would, uh, I would say, um, if, you, if you understand it as, as deep incarnation, deep incarnation to me implies deeply grounded, deeply grounded word the word in the, in the whole of created reality. So therefore, we can recover some of the kind of classical elements. And in this respect, um, uh, William Carroll's understanding of God as the ground of being would still be consistent with the kind of approach that I'm suggesting, although it takes it on a little bit further in some respects in that, in that it's conscious of history as well as simply a metaphysics. What's interesting about Balthasar is that he was influenced by Thomas Aquinas, but he didn't just stay there. He also drew in other elements in a fairly eclectic way now, you might say, well, you know, it's easier and simpler for us just to recover a single strand in the tradition and reappropriate that. I would say that what's, what's interesting about Balthasar is he sticks to the, what I would say, the spirit behind Aquinas, which is the spirit of, 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 of wanting to bring in other views. But he doesn't understand, Balthasar doesn't understand evolution all that well. So this is where I've modified his approach. He treats evolution as an epic and only an epic, and that's the only way you can think of evolution. I think that, that evolution can be, um, uh, if you like, reconceived in ways which are more true to, to what biologists are saying about evolution, so to, to make it less, or some biologists at least, not all biologists. So some biologists would talk of evolution as a, especially the evolutionary psychologists, as some sort of grand narrative. I think that is a mistake. So I think we need to join up with those biologists who stress more contingency. Simon Conway Morris's position of, um, of convergence would still apply because you can say that this improvisation of the drama, as it were, is, if you like, known in retrospect. And that's what theodrama does. It allows us to look back and in retrospect and you say, yes, this is the, this is the way the play was meant to go, as it were. But you don't know at the time. There's the, in, the indeterminacy in there. There's the there's the not knowing, there's the, the participation in the acting and so on. So you get this combination. Um, and when you, if you want to, to talk about Christ as both um, the creator and the redeemer, as it were, in Colossians, that's still there, but it's re, re described in a slightly different way. So I wanted to just get clear on perhaps uh, the direction in which you were going and then, and then ask a quick question. Um, it seems to me that the relationship between science and religion has to be understood not only in terms of, of, our, of, of our minds, but also in terms of our hearts and our wills. So if we're going to talk about science and religion, it's very helpful to talk about the, 
the total dimension of the human person attempting to understand and make sense of science and religion. And, and in that respect, your comments about, about theodrama, I think, are very helpful and very liberating and very enriching. But then the question arises, if that indeed is what you're doing, broadening the perspective for our dialogue, um, how is it that we talk about truth claims in the context of drama or theater? Um, well, I, I'm, I think that, uh, I think what I was trying to get at was that some of the ways in which we talk about, oh, is this working? I'm the, sorry, it's the wrong microphone. Some of the ways we talk about truth claims are in what I will call synchronic mode. In other words, we fix in a certain sort of story or narrative that is, that, that, that only allows one possible interpretation. This is, if you like, I would say a safety valve in the human, in the human mind because, because on that basis we are able to understand things in a particular kind of way. I don't think um, theodrama is outside of those truth claims, but I think that it, that it allows us another reading, which, if you like, lends more intimacy to what we have to say. In other words, we become more participants rather than simply um, claiming that, that we're on somehow on outside it. And I think this, this uh, bears on postmodern um, thinking, which says that we are always embedded in a, in a context. We can't claim that somehow we're outside that context. So it's an acknowledgement of the context within which we find ourselves. So it's not, it's not anti-truth claims. It's, I'm, what I, when I mentioned that, if I did, um, what I was trying to say was the kind of the, the kind of narrative that just talks about evolution at a theoretical level and doesn't actually try to redescribe who we are in relation to the evolutionary process or in relation to the to other creatures and so on is somehow missing something. So so um, those descriptions are there and they have their own uh, validity, but I think they are insufficient. So 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 it's just a, it's just a, a different way of approaching the problem and a different way of, if you like, reconceiving, especially um, the person of Christ. Because I think if we, if we go down that route of seeing evolution just in terms of um, this is what it says, this is our knowledge of what it is, then we could easily miss out our, a Christology altogether and say, well, this is something which is completely separate, we're separating it off. What I was trying to do is saying that maybe we can have a dialogue between maybe there's a way of thinking about who Christ is which actually facilitates that dialogue rather than leads to a kind of separation or a, a distancing between the two. But, but it's, not a, it's not a coming together that's a synthesis. It's richer than that. It's a way of trying to understand ourselves and who we are, both, um, both from a biological level but also at a theological level as well. So it's trying to, to, to re, uh, uh, rethink what that might mean while retaining something of the classical tradition of who Christ is, but at the same time putting it in a language or in a, in, in a way that makes sense, and it makes sense to biologists, uh, but in such a way that they, the truth claims, as it were, of, of who we, what we see in Christ is not compromised, and the truth claims of, of, uh, of um, evolution is not compromised, but it's not, just, it's not treated as if it's some sort of detached map in other words, it's about how we understand what truth is and what it means. And that's what I was trying to get at in, the, in, my, in, in this um, fairly experimental uh, mode of thinking about things. <laughs>